Hello everyone. In this lecture we're going to discuss selected material from chapter 5 of your text. In this chapter we're going to focus on short-term memory and working memory. Now first of all, what is memory? We define memory in cognitive psychology as the processes involved in retaining, retrieving, and using information about stimuli, images, events, ideas, and skills after the original information is no longer present. So of course this is after whatever we're trying to remember is no longer around us anymore. So whatever event happened or you know something like that, for example, if we're trying to remember what we did you know last week, all of that information is no longer directly available for us. So now we're having to retrieve from memory um, information about that event. Okay? Now, we say that memory is active any time past experience has an impact on how you think or behave in the future um, or right now, for example. So if you're trying to think about what you did last week, then your memory is now active of that particular event. And it's only active, we say, when it has, again, some impact on what you're doing currently or what's going to happen in the future. Now, if we take a look at a model of memory, um, we can take a look at one um, proposed by Atkinson and Schriffen in 1968. They propose that there's three different types of memory. The first of which, where it all starts, would be sensory memory. So this is the initial stage that is holding all the incoming information from the environment. And sensory memory is said to only last just a couple of seconds, if not a fraction of a second. And then from there, short-term memory can hold about five to seven items of information for about 15 to 20 seconds. And then if um, it gets rehearsed and all that good stuff, then it will move to long-term memory. And long-term memory can hold a large amount of information for years or even decades. This would be an example of a modal model of memory. And we call this a modal model because it contains a lot of features that many memory models um, were proposing um, in the 1960s. So here we have an um, example of input from the environment. So we have a lot of information coming in from the environment, coming into our sensory memory. And something is selected off here and passed into short-term memory. And again, remember, sensory memory is only like a second, maybe two seconds long max. So something gets selected out from this input, moved on to short-term memory. Remember, short-term memory only lasts 15 to 20 seconds or so, so we think. Um, and we either use it or lose it at this point. So if we use it, which would be the output here, um, then it, it's essentially gone. It's not going to move on to long-term memory. Now, keep in mind, when we do something like this, this is kind of like where we're repeating the digits to a phone number, trying to just remember it long enough to dial it. That's what would be a good example of just short-term memory straight to output. Now, the other option is to rehearse. We can rehearse this, and then uh, with enough rehearsal, this will move it to long-term memory. So this will last uh, quite a long time. And if we want to retrieve from long-term memory, then we have to first retrieve and then move it back to short-term memory so we can use it in the present moment. Now, control processes. These are active processes that can be controlled by the person, so we think. The first of which would be rehearsal. So we just talked about that briefly. So that's basically where you're using some sort of technique to memorize um, the information that you want to move into memory. So, for example, repeating numbers of a phone number over and over again. You're rehearsing that. So it's uh, making it a bit more likely that you're going to hang on to that information. Um, using strategies to make the stimulus a bit more memorable. So trying to um, tack it on to something that's already in your memory. Trying to make some sort of association with a new item or a new event with an old one, for example. Kind of giving it something to hang on to that's already in your memory. Um, that might make it a bit more likely that you'll remember the new item. And also strategies of attention. You know, Remember we talked about attention already in the last chapter. Strategies of attention that help you focus on specific stimuli. So using some sort of um, strategy when you're trying to focus on something that might help you um, do a bit of a better job at focusing on a specific stimulus in the environment to be remembered later. Now we'll go more in depth a bit with each of the components of that modal model of memory.
Now, first we'll take a look at sensory memory. Uh, we define this formally as the retention for a for very brief periods of time of the effects of sensory stimulation. So this could be any kind of sense that we um, have activated by the environment. So it could be touch, smell, um, auditory, it could be vision. But remember sensory memory is just a very very brief period of time. And this information that we're getting here from the environment into sensory memory decays very very quickly. Now we do see some effects with sensory memory such as persistence of vision and this would be the retention of the perception of light for example. So the example that's a really good one I think for this is the sparklers trail of light. So if you've ever um, on the 4th of July lit a sparkler and kind of moved it about you notice that there's kind of a trail of light that the sparkler leaves as you move it you kind of see the trail of the light moving behind the sparkler and that's not really there we, this is just a good example of persistence of vision you're still seeing the sparkler light kind of following the actual sparkler but it's not really there it's just a persistence of vision that we have when we um, experience this with our sensory um, memory Now, the thing about our sensory memory is that while the information doesn't last very long and it decays very rapidly, it does hold a large amount of information for a very short period of time. And of course, it also collects information from the environment, so collecting everything that our senses are experiencing, and holds information for the initial processing. And it does fill in blanks, so any kind of information that we either missed in the environment or is just not present, our sensory memory tends to fill in those blanks. Now, how do we measure capacity for sensory memory? How do we know that it's it, it doesn't have well it has might have a very large capacity? How do we know that it doesn't have a very long duration? Well, this uh, study was done by Sperling in 1960, and they used a screen experiment where they flashed a array of letters very quickly on the screen. So this would be kind of like what you see in the um, eye doctor's office when you go to the ophthalmologist and you have to read the letters off the, the chart. So it's kind of like the eye test. Kind of like that. An array of letters would flash very quickly on the screen. And they would ask participants to report as many as possible. So as many um, letters as they saw as possible after they uh, participated in this experiment. Now when they used the whole report method, so this is where participants were just asked to report as many as they could see. Participants reported seeing about an average of four and a half letters out of the 12 letters. So it's about 37 and a half percent. So not that great. But when they used the partial report method, so this is where they're, they're telling participants to um, focus on just one row of letters, for example, instead of looking at the whole grid of letters. And this would be done by um, playing a tone that would be associated with that specific row of letters. So they would have different tones associated with row one, two, three, and with enough experience participants would recognize that tone two, for example, would mean to look at row two, for example. And when they did this, um, participants recalled an average of 3.3 .3 letters out of four letters in that row. So that's an 82% average. So, um, and something else they found was that participants could report any of the rows. So um, they could be directed to any of the rows. And the last thing we can look at is delayed partial report method. So this would be presentation of the tone delayed for a fraction of a second after the letters were extinguished. So participants would see the letters first and then after they would be shut off, then they would hear a tone. So it's kind of telling them, oh, okay, you only need to focus on row two, for example, after the fact, after they've already seen the array of letters. And performance decreases rapidly when you do this, as one might imagine. So in that experiment, looking at participants' ability to recall letters that were flashed into an array, um, what we say is kind of going on here is um, participants are using iconic memory. So this would be brief sensory memory of things that we see. So this would be kind of the remnant that's just left for maybe a second or so. When we see something on a screen, for example, and then it's taken away, we kind of see a bit of a shadow or something, kind of a remnant of what we just saw. And it's only there for just a second, and then it's gone, but we do see it there for just a split second.
And we say that this is responsible for that persistence of vision, kind of like that sparkler trail, for example. And the same type thing we see with auditory as well, so echoic memory. This is that brief sensory memory of things we hear. So if I were to play you a tone, for example, and then shut it off, it would kind of echo for you for a brief second or so, even though it's it, the sound's completely gone at that point. And again, this echoic memory is what's responsible for that just brief period of persistence of sound that we hear. Now if I take a look at short-term memory, this is storing small amounts of information for a brief duration. Remember, 15 to 20 seconds or so. And this includes both new information that's coming in from the sensory stores or sensory memory, and also information recalled from long-term memory. When we're trying to retrieve something from long-term memory, the idea with this model is that it needs to go from long-term memory into short-term memory so we can immediately use it. Now, when we try to measure the duration of short-term memory, so how long does information actually last in short-term memory, we can do something like this. We can ask participants to read three letters, letters aloud and then a number, and then ask them to begin counting backward by threes. And then after a set amount of time, have them recall those three letters. Now, after three seconds of counting, participants perform at about 80% or so. But after about 18 seconds of counting, participants perform only at about 10%. So somewhere between those, the three-second mark and the 18-second mark, performance dips by 70% on average. Now, this reduction in performance is explained by the existence of decay. So this is where um, basically we have information that's just kind of vanishing um, as, as a function of time. So we have a memory trace that's essentially just dying off um, due to, again, passage of time, but also exposure to other competing stimuli because keep in mind, you have constantly things that are coming into your sensory memory. So it's constantly things that are coming in from the environment that you're experiencing, and that's going to be competing for resources with what you're trying to hold in your short-term memory. So just as a function of time delay, your um, memory trace for that specific information is going to weaken and eventually vanish. So again, we know just from these type of simple experiments that short-term memory is definitely a limited span and again usually 15-20 seconds or so. Now again, more specifically, we say that short-term memory again is about 15 to 20 seconds, but this is very important to keep in mind. This is only so when rehearsal is prevented. So this is when you are not allowed to rehearse any item. On average, it will stay in short-term memory for about 15 to 20 seconds like we were talking about. So now we'll continue with short-term memory by looking at a couple of things that can happen in terms of interference. And the first we'll look at is proactive interference. And this happens when we have the learning of new information being interfered with by information we've already learned. So this happens again when information we've already learned before interferes with us trying to learn something new now. And um, just to give you an example, so your native language may make it more difficult to learn and remember a new foreign language, for example. Any of you all have, who have taken foreign language classes when you were an older student in high school or now as a college student, um, it's really difficult to learn a second language now that you are very fluent in your native language. Um, and this is just a decent example of proactive interference where you have previously learned information, which is your native language, really interfering with your ability to learn a new language. And the opposite can also be so. This is called retroactive interference. So this is um, when we have um, new learning interfering with remembering old learning. So it's the exact opposite of proactive interference. And an example of this would be for um, just uh, after you get a new telephone number and you use it for a while, you might have a difficult time remembering what your old telephone number was. So again, just keep in mind, it can work both ways. It's more situation dependent um, and, and it's probably also more dependent on what you use more. So for example, when you're learning a new language, well, you're still using your native language a lot more than your new one. And with the example of retroactive interference, once you get a new telephone number, you're using that number a lot more than you're using your old one. So it's, this is probably also kind of having a lot to do with what particular information you're using more. Now, we've talked about duration of short-term memory. Now we talk about capacity of short-term memory.
In terms of digit span, how many digits can a person remember? Well, the typical result for your average person is usually about five to eight items. But we have to think about what is an item. Now, when we say item and we're looking at digit span, we think it's a singular item. However, it is possible to do something called chunking. So this is where we're creating small units um, and we're combining um, small units with more small units to create larger, more meaningful units. So taking a variety of information and making it a singular unit or a singular chunk. And more specifically, a, a chunk is a collection of elements that are strongly associated with one another. So we would want to group like items together, but we also want them weakly associated with elements in other chunks. So we don't want them to be very related to other items in other chunks. But again, this is just kind of a way to increase our capacity of short-term memory by lumping like items together to create a singular item. This is a study that was done in 1980 looking at a trained college student. So they took a college student with just average memory and trained the student on how to chunk. And this particular student had an initial digit span of seven. So an, an initial span of seven um, in short-term memory, which is, again, average. After 230 one-hour training sessions, this student could remember up to 79 digits. And they did this by chunking them into meaningful units. Now, again, this is a lot of practice, 231 hour training sessions. But the point of this is that your short term memory span can be increased, but it takes a lot of training. And chunking is really the way it has to be done. You have to be able to chunk meaningful and like items together into larger singular chunks. So you can increase your short term memory. Now we take a look at working memory. Now this is a very similar concept to short-term memory, and it was developed by Badley and Hitch in 1974. They defined working memory as being a limited capacity system for temporary storage, like short-term memory. But they also proposed that um, in this particular stage, that manipulation of information for complex tasks, such as comprehension and um, reasoning, for example, could happen in working memory. Now, again, working memory is kind of the newer idea or newer version of short-term memory. Um, it is very similar, but the working, the idea of working memory is different from short-term memory. Um, the idea of short-term memory was just that it held information for a short period of time. But working memory, um, at least the proposed function of working memory, is more concerned with not only processing but manipulation of information that's occurring um, during complex cognitive tasks. And here is the proposed working memory model of, um, that, that Badley proposed. And he proposed that it had three main components. So it had the phonological loop, the visuospatial sketch pad, and then in the center here, the central executive. And note the overlaps between these three items. So first we'll take a look at phonological loop, and we can take a look at the phonological similarity effect. So this would be, for example, when we have letters or words that sound similar and we confuse them because they do sound similar. Um, we can also see this in the word length effect. This is where we see a memory for lists of words um, is typically better for shorter words than for longer words. And it also takes longer to rehearse long words and to produce them during recall. Now, also in articular uh, suppression, this is where we're trying to get participants to memorize a list of words, for example, but we prevent them from rehearsing the items to be remembered by having the participant repeat a nonsense language, so some sort of nonsense syllables just over and over again as they're being presented with the items. So essentially the idea is that by doing this, it prevents them from rehearsing the items. And what we see, of course, as you might expect, a uh, reduction in memory span of the items to be remembered. Um, but this also eliminates the word length effect. So once we do something like this, short words versus long words, there really is no effect. And it also reduces phonological similarity effects. So when things, a different item sounds similar, um, it reduces that effect as well.
So now we can move to Visual Spatial Sketchpad. So the phonological loop again was more focused on auditory. Visual Spatial Sketchpad, as you might imagine, is more focused on visual or visual imagery. And we say visual imagery is the creation of visual images in the mind. So we're imagining what things look like in our mind in the absence of the actual physical item or physical visual stimulus. And this particular study was done in 71. And this is a mental rotation task. So you can see the different objects here on the right hand side of the screen. And the goal would be for the participant to imagine one of those objects and mentally rotate it to match the next object. And what they found was that tasks that called for greater rotations or just more rotations, degree of rotation, took longer to perform mentally which would be consistent with the actual physical manipulation if somebody were to actually physically do this task. A larger um, rotation would also take longer as well. Now working memory is set up to process different types of information simultaneously. So you can be doing both visual and auditory for example. But working memory has trouble when similar types of information are presented at the same time. Now, this brings us then to the central executive. That was that central item. This is essentially the attention controller. So this is um, essentially focusing attention, um, dividing attention, switching attention back and forth between items. So it's kind of directing the traffic of attention. And it also controls suppression of irrelevant information. So when we have a lot of incoming information, it will suppress what is irrelevant. Now, Badley also proposed, in addition to his um, three-item model of working memory, he proposed that there was an additional component called the episodic buffer. And this was just to basically accommodate for there being communication um, between this particular um, section of memory, so working memory and long-term memory. So he proposed that there was a backup store that would communicate with long-term memory and working memory components. So there's kind of this buffer between working memory and long-term memory. And the episodic buffer is supposed to hold information longer than working memory and have greater capacity than the phonological loop or the visuospatial sketch pad. And here's how that fits into Badley's original model. So he revised the model. So we still have our three components that he had had before, but then he's also added in this episodic buffer and this communication between these, these different um, um, portions of the model and long-term memory. And of course we have the central executive kind of managing all of the different three items here. So take a look at this um, particular model more carefully in your text and just make sure you understand the role of each component of the model and take a look at the chapter as a whole, of course, as always, and have a great week, guys. I'll